So the question is, will reading set you free? We will find out today with Satre, Qu'est-ce que la littérature? But before we start, I would just like to say that I declare that we all know that Satre was a so this is an image that I am including every time I reference him in image. And yes, I believe in the death of the author, but I also do believe that we should take a human being in their totality. So while I will genuinely and enthusiastically appreciate his genius in this text, I do not forget that he has very deformed interests. So let us begin. This text that I chose is actually pretty long, and I tried to cut it up as much as I could without losing its meaning. It was almost two pages, but yeah, I definitely think it's worth it. It's extremely interesting because he opposes two ideas of Kant. One is uh, Kant's aesthetic idea of finality without end, and his second, which is um, Kant's moralism of l'imperatif catégorique. And the added layer that makes this interesting is that he actually disagrees with uh, Kant's approach to aesthetic, but then he agrees with Kant's, um, um, no, I wouldn't say he agrees with Kant's uh, imperative catégorique, but he uses that or he leans on that to basically bring to the forefront that yes, reading will set you free, but let's see how we get there. Let us begin. Le livre ne sert pas ma liberté, il la recueille. Il se propose comme fin à la liberté du lecteur. So the book does not use my, my freedom, it requires it. It proposes itself as an end, which is the liberty of the reader. Et l'expression kantien de finalité sans fin me paraît tout à fait impropre à désigner l'œuvre d'art. So he disagrees with the Kantian expression of finality without end um, to designate a work of art. So finality without end is Kant's theory where we can actually disassociate uh, an object, a work of art, beauty with utility, beauty with function. So the disinterested gaze uh, onto an object is what neutralizes its need to have a function. And this doesn't jive with Sartre, and we will see why. Elle implique que, en effet, que l'objet esthétique présente seulement l'apparence d'une finalité et se bon à solliciter le jeu libre et réglé de l'imagination. So what this is trying to say is that a finality without end. So the existence of something, like the point of something, the finality of something, the point of something without function kind of just relegates the work of art to appearance. And it kind of relegates a work of art to something that is regulated by the imagination or subjected to the imagination and that it is only limited to soliciting the imaginations of other people. So it kind of makes the work of art at the mercy of the spectator. It doesn't, it doesn't have like a value of itself, it's just an appearance that might or might not get our eye, might or might not um, excite our imagination. C'est oublier que l'imagination du spectateur n'a pas seulement une fonction régulatrice mais constitutive. Elle ne joue pas, elle est appelée à recomposer l'objet beau par-delà les traces laissées par l'artiste. So what it's trying to say is that imagination is not something that is judging the work of art. It is not something that is separate to the work of art, but it is what constitutes the work of art. It is the participation of the reader with the work of art that makes it the work of art. And this is really exciting because, okay, what he says at the end is that like it is calling upon us to recompose the beautiful object from the traces left by the artist. In that sense, like every time you pick up a book, the words are just traces left behind that we recreate the work of art. So there's an idea of creation within the reader and your imagination is the thing that puts things together to create something. It is no longer this passive thing of like, oh, I pick up this book and this book is telling me what um, what happened. You are the one who's creating the story as you engage with the story, as your imagination engages with the story. And that idea is extremely interesting because that means that this dialogue that you have with the author is timeless. It's not restricted to time or space. Like the work of art in a, like the book itself is something that could connect people beyond time and space, which is, okay, super poetic and is my interpretation. But I think that's 
I think that's like so beautiful because there were times when I picked up a book by, I don't know, Chekhov and I really related to the character and I'm like so many years, like decades and decades separated from this guy with like a cultural conditioning that's completely separate from this guy and it, it hits a nerve. And um, I'm, I'm anticipating because this is something that Satsuki says like, you know, in his later part of the text. So the idea that an object can as long as this one, as long as an object survives, this object survives, you can always have a connection between, you know, you can say like between the author and the reader, but it's just the connection between two people, two individuals beyond time and space. And I think, I think I should move on because I think I made my point. En définissant le beau de cette manière, comme finalité sans fin, on pourra, et c'est bien le but de Kant, assimiler la beauté de l'art à la beauté naturelle. Puisqu'une fleur, par exemple, présente tant de symétrie, des couleurs si harmonieuses, des curbes si régulières, qu'on est immédiatement tenté de chercher une explication finaliste à toutes ces propriétés et d'y avoir autant de moyens déposés en vue d'une fin inconnue. So here he shits on Kant. <laughs> so he's saying that it, what Kant is trying to do with saying that uh, beauty is finality without end is that he's trying to make it so that you can find a parallel between the beauty of art and the natural beauty, which is the beauty of nature. It's an attempt, and this is um, the problem of intellectualism and finality, where we use the consequence to explain the cause. We are trying to rationalize something with our intellect. Sometimes like there is no way to get through the cause just through intellect. But the problem with that is that like when you are so apt on trying to find like a reason for things, you start creating like you start creating connections and relationships that might actually cloud your judgment that might actually make you confuse the order of things so to bring this back full circle Sartre says that Kant uses this because Kant by equalizing nature with a work of art you can then have a plethora of ways to try to find this unknown end so it's just the intellectualism quest to rationalize everything but c'est justement l'erreur. But it is just an error. La beauté de la nature n'est en rien comparable à celle d'art. Beauty of nature is nothing to do, nothing comparable with that of art. L'œuvre d'art n'a pas de fin. Nous sommes d'accord avec Kant. Work of art has no end. We there we agree with Kant. Well, he agrees with Kant. Mais ce qu'elle est une fin, but that it is an end. La, la formulaire kantienne ne rend pas compte de l'appel qui résonne au fond de chaque tableau, de chaque statue, de chaque livre. What the Kantian formula does not take into account is the call which resonates in every painting, in every statue, in every book. Kant croit que l'œuvre existe d'abord en fait et qu'elle est vue ensuite, au lieu qu'elle n'existe que si on la regarde et qu'elle est d'abord pure appel, pure exigence d'exister. So Kant believes that the work exists before it is looked at. And then this is where Sartre comes in with instead of it not existing if we don't look at it, it exists first and foremost as pure call, pure appel, pure exigence d'exister, pure demand to exist. So what Sartre's trying to say here is that like the art does not like does not cease to exist if no one looks at it. What is saying that is that art itself is this being that's screaming at us for its own existence. If we go back to the beginning, it's not something it's just like, hey, look at me, play your imagination with me. It is something that calls to us so that it itself can come into existence. It is not only our imagination that brings it into existence, it is something that calls to us to bring it to existence. There's like this huge active like creation, existence, clubhouse banger going on here. <laughs> am I am I vulgarizing this too much? Okay. Elle n'est pas un instrument dont l'existence est manifeste et la fin indéterminée. Elle se présente comme une tâche à remplir. Elle se place d'emblée au nouveau de l'impératif catégorique. So this is where we move on to the second part. I know it sounds kind of crazy. I'm gonna see if like this makes sense. Art is not an instrument to existence that wants to manifest itself. So art is not like the physical result of 
something that wants to come into existence. But what art is, is art is this demand for a task to be accomplished. I'm going to continue because it's going to explain itself. Elle se place d'emblée au niveau de l'imperatif catégorique. So this is where he introduces the imperatif catégorique, categoric imperative of Kant. So in this context, he's using l'imperatif catégorique comme l'appel. In terms of, oh, Kant says that the imperative categoric is our call to fulfill our duty. And l'imperatif catégorique, um, in terms of liberty, is that we are only truly free if we can make choices outside of our passions, outside of um, how we feel about things. When we can surmount our irrational side, where we can use our reason to make better <laughs> better decisions, when we can use our reason to decide to follow our duty, to be like a good citizen, to be like a good student, <laughs> I'm rolling my eyes, to be like a good friend, to be like, to, to never lie, ever, 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 ever. When we can choose to fulfill these values, these obligations, that is when we are free, that we are not subjected to our passions. So that is like a quick rundown of like the that relationship. But we're going to see here how Sartre develops this. Vous êtes parfaitement libre de laisser ce livre sur la table. Mais si vous l'ouvrez, vous en assumez la responsabilité. You're perfectly free to leave the book on the table, but if you open it, you are assuming and you're accepting the responsibility. Car la liberté ne se prouve dans la jouissance du libre fonctionnement subjectif, mais dans un acte créateur recuit par un impératif. So this is where he goes beyond like Kant's idea of freedom, where I just said that Kant's idea of freedom is that when we can surmount like our passions to make a subjective choice to go for a higher cause, which is fulfilling our obligations, our devoir. So what is really interesting about this text, it's not just the fact that I can make any choice, it's the fact that in of itself, the task in of itself is this creative task. And I'm just going to continue to show you the difference between like the subjective realm and something that brings us further and past this subjective realm. Cette fin absolue, cette impérative transcendante est pourtant consentie. Repris à son camp par la liberté même, c'est ce qu'on nomme une valeur. L'œuvre d'art est valeur parce qu'elle est appel. So it's no longer just like, oh, I'm a free subjective thing, I'm going to choose like between like different things that interest me. No, there is this transcendent calling like towards us to create this act in of itself. And that is the thing that frees us. It's like, if you remain in this bubble of like all your, your subjective choices that you can have, right? If like all these things within your realm of possibilities, within your realm of understanding, you won't actually, it's not a liberation because you, you're making a choices within this certain context. But when there is something outside of you, something transcendent, something not subjective, giving you this opportunity or calling to you towards this opportunity, to create, that is what frees you. And the first thing that comes into my mind is like when you pick up a book and you read it and it opens up your world. There is genuinely something so special about picking up a book and living in the world of a person through how they describe it, through like their imagery that will literally bring you to a different mental state of being. I used to think that like watching movies is something that you know, creates sympathy in society, connects us through stories, but that is still a superficial layer, right? Where, you know, we are subjected to images, we're subjected to sound. And I think in comparison to reading a book, reading a book is probably the most active thing we can do to try to understand something. When one picks up a book and we read those characters, we are the ones who are putting it together and we are combining our essence with the essence of the book in front of us. And there's no other way for us to have this connective tissue between us and a different story uh, that I know of in comparison. Because it's like, it's a solitary activity, but it's an activity that requires both the traces left by the, the writer, but also us giving, giving, our, giving our attention and our generosity to reconstruct these images based on our imagery. Our imagery plus another person's like traces of their imagery through words, through symbolism, through representation is how I think like we actually learn to live 
and understand outside of ourselves or at least get closer and closer to that. Sorry, I got carried away. Let me translate the last two sentences. Uh, cette forme absolue, c'est imperative transcendante et pourtant consentie. So this final absolute end is, uh, is a transcendent calling, a transcendent obligation that is, however, consented. We consent by exercising our freedom. C'est ce qu'on nomme une valeur. So the book uh, is fin absolu, art is fin absolu, and this is what we call a value. L'œuvre d'art est valeur parce qu'elle est appel. The direct translation is work of art is value because it is calling. What he's doing here is that he's making reference to l'imparatif catégorique, but what he's saying is that it is much more than just because it is universally wanted or universally actionable, but more so that it is because it is a calling. It is it is a calling to set us free. Like, he's a... but... I don't know. Well, I do know. And, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm shook. I'm shook. And I really enjoyed that. I hope you did too. What do you think? Like, do, do you think that... Like, would you classify that as a form of freedom? Would you say in that way it sets us free? But yeah, thank you for joining me in my little corner of YouTube. Thank you for subscribing if you have already. Uh, let me know what you think. And thank you for your patience dealing with school. And I'm gonna go now. So have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully next week, if not the week after. Uh, I have news about my books that I would like to share. And it would actually talk a bit more about another quote that I really like from Sartre. But until then, be well, stay warm, stay cool, stay comfortable. And I'll talk to you soon.